Good evening, everybody. Thank you so, so much for joining us. My name is Wendy Mitchell. I'm thrilled to be your host and moderator tonight. Uh, we have an amazing panel of the supporting actress nominees for this year's EE e. BAFTA film sessions. Wow. Uh, this is an annual series that celebrates the nominees from the upcoming EE e. British Academy Film Awards, of course. Just a few housekeeping notes before we start. Uh, you can join the conversation by using the hashtag on social, hashtag EEBAFTAs. If you have a question, just go down below in the chat and uh, we'll come to some of those questions at the end of our discussion. Uh, we have a uh, British Sign Language, BSL, available today, um, thanks to our interpreters, Donna and Anna, and really appreciate their being here. And also captions are available by hitting the CC button at the bottom of the screen. I nearly need to pinch myself to introduce the speakers we have here today. Uh, I'm thrilled that we can welcome Angela Bassett, who is nominated for Black Panther, Wakanda Forever, Hong Chow for The Whale, Carrie Condon for The Banshees of Anna Sharon, Dolly DeLeon for Triangle of Sadness, and she gets an extra gold star because it's 3 a.m. in Manila, Dolly. And of course, not last, our least, Jamie Lee Curtis for Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. Uh, unfortunately, Carrie Mulligan, who is the other nominee in this category, uh, was unable to join us, but she sends her best regards to the fellow nominees and is sorry to miss you, the audience. So I'm gonna try to be serious and not talk too much about donkeys or hot dog fingers, I promised myself. <laughs> Um, I wanted to start with a question that I'll go around and ask each, each of you about. Um, just about if you can go back to the gut feeling you had when you read this particular script that you're now nominated for, what did you think was interesting, uh, especially about your character? Um, Angela, I wanted to start with you because obviously you had played Ramonda in the first Black Panther film, but what was special about her journey this time? Well, more was going to be required of her, you know, um, that's pretty much what Ryan, our director and co-writer um, mentioned to me before I was able to crack open the script. And in that taking more, just taking as we saw more of a leadership role in the first one, it was more very supportive, the background, you know, letting the, the uh, you know, the king and the sister, the son, the daughter lead the way, but in this one, um, I uh, had to lead the nation, um, lead the nation in mourning, be be the sovereign leader. Mm. So um, it was completely and totally unexpected. I didn't know to what degree, but it was mm. unexpected, you know, of course, because we lost our, our, our lead actor. Um, so uh, a, a great deal more was placed um, on Queen Ramonda's shoulders, mm. literally and figuratively. And I mean, I'm sure that was quite emotional too, um, was, after his passing, was, to know that you were gonna be queen. Yeah. yeah, a double-edged, you know, a double-edged sword. You know, mm -hmm. it as an actor, you're, you're, you know, you welcome more opportunity, uh, you know, grand opportunity, a, a bigger stage, um, more lines, more everything. <laughs> but because of the circumstance, of course, that was, um, you know, that was, you know, very sad. To me going through a great um a, a, a real great amount of grief because mm. of losing chat with yeah. so it was you know it was that that happy sad that sweet mm. and sour. I do have to say I mean the film I think portrays that grief um very very sensitively so congratulations on being able to handle that um Jamie can I come to you next uh, you know, do, do the Daniels talk you through this? Do you get a script? Did that script even make sense? Why, why did you want to come on board? So uh, they didn't talk me through anything. I read it. Um, I didn't understand it. I'm sure I still don't really understand it as a script. I understand it as a movie, of course. Um, I've always approached my work to understand what is my job? Why am I, why do you need me? What, what is my piece of the pie? Um, uh, and, and that's really why I'm there. I don't need to understand the whole. 
Um, that's not my job. That's the director's job. Um, my job is to understand the human. And I understood Deirdre, Bo Beardra, um, as well as I've ever understood anyone. I know Deirdre. I know many Deirdres. Um, I, I am Deirdre. Um, in many ways, I have felt forgotten. I have, in many ways, I have felt loss and longing. Um, I, I have never been in a position of her power, but it's a strange power uh, bureaucrats have. And they wield that power, but they're incredibly lonely. And uh, as soon as I understood that, and then, you know, my job is to show up as Deirdre. I, I don't ask a lot of questions. I, I'm open to collaboration. I'm certainly collaborate with Shirley, the costume designer, and Anissa and, and Michelle to create what Deirdre looked like and Josh, our prop man, to create um, aspects of her. But, you know, my job is to show up 100% ready to work when I do my work. And so uh, it didn't matter. The beautiful thing that I learned about the movie was I also... I'm, I'm very curious and I sit on set and I never am in my trailer. And when we shot the laundromat sequence, um, I learned what the movie was about because I watched James Hong and Tally um, have their scene of, of what that relationship was. I watched Key and Michelle re reunify in that beautiful sequence. And then I got to have a scene with Michelle where these two women bonded and as soon as all of those sequences were shot i went oh in the midst of all of this um insanity lies great truth about the human condition mm -hmm. and um how beautiful that was going to be yes yeah, really with all the metaverse and everything it's a film about family yeah in many ways and love uh, and we can all and really love and family. kindness mm -hmm. and um failure mm -hmm. it's a movie about being a failure yeah. and that that is okay. It's about, you know, the immigrants experience. It's about the American dream gone bad. Um, it's, it's about a lot of things, but at the center of it is love, mm -hmm. of course. Uh, Dolly, can I come to you next? Um, when you first heard about this role of Abigail in Triangle of Sadness, um, did Ruben explain it to you or did you sort of get it on the page what what drew you in oh, nothing was explained to me um actually when i auditioned for the part uh i was only given three of the sides from the script and as a brief synopsis of of the of the script and when i got the part that's the only time i really read the script and when i did read it i i I, I sort of relate a lot to Abigail, the character I play in the film. So it was, you know, it was easy for me to get into her head or to really understand who she was until it wasn't, you know, until I couldn't understand her and I was constantly searching for her. So it was really um, a big surprise for me when I read the script because um, Abigail is a character who turns everything around. Hmm. She just, you know... Uh, throws everything off balance and takes everyone out of their comfort zone. So it was a very exciting part for me to play in a very exciting film where you don't expect something like that to happen. Yes, many unexpected moments in Triangle of Sadness. Um, I hope everybody here has seen it. Uh, Hong, can I come to you? And when you first heard about the whale and the role of Liz, what, what drew you in or did you have any trepidation? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I Well, to paint the picture, I had just um, had a baby, my first child, and uh, my agent uh, reached out and told me that Darren Aronofsky was working uh, on, on a film. And I think all he told me was that the character I would be up for was um, Brendan Fraser's best friend, and who also happened to be a nurse and, and took care of him. And so just based on that, I thought she was going to be a certain way, like, oh, the really sweet best friend <laughs> who's just a, uh, always there and, and, um, and very level-headed. And, and once I read the script, I, I thought, oh, this is not your typical best friend role. Um, she's 
she has so many contradictory qualities about her and that was uh, really fun to get to calibrate uh, those different qualities where she's, she's um, kind, but she's caustic and she's reliable, but she's also um, incredibly angry. And uh, the rehearsal process for that was, was really helpful for me. Um, we had three weeks of rehearsal. Uh, it was helpful just, just in terms of, of, of getting the lines down because I'm, I, I don't like to, I, I always like to honor the writing and, and, and the written word and I don't really want to veer from it. I don't actually like improv that much on, on, on set. And um, it was really helpful for me because I kind of had um, mommy brain going on at the time. And it was also an opportunity to get to work with Brendan and also watch Sadie and Ty and Samantha over Zoom. Um, uh, to hear the words out loud and to feel their energy and their presence and how that would affect everything. And it was also, the rehearsal process was really important um, for us because once we got on set, we, because of COVID, because of the COVID protocols, we weren't really allowed to socialize um, that much. If, if we, you know, if a conversation went on for too long, the first AD would run in and be like, you need to separate. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was, um, it was a really, beautiful uh thing to, to be coming out of for, for the industry to be getting back up on its feet ap mm. after COVID and, and figuring things out for the whale to be the first thing that I got to work on I feel like it was so miraculous yeah really special piece of work uh, I want to come to Carrie finally um and I've heard that Martin McDonough wrote this role with you in mind so I guess you had to say yes but but what did you like about Siobhan or what was interesting for you to to tackle with her well, I suppose the first thing I thought when I when I knew he was going to do it was before I had done plays of his um, and this was like, oh, it's like a play, an Irish play, but a movie. So I was just thrilled that people were going to get to see his Irish plays like that, which I think are my favorite of his work, but in a movie. So I was just excited for that to happen. And then in terms of me, bizarrely, like and actually looking back, kind of ungrateful. But initially I was like, Oh, it's not as good as the parts I did in the plays. That was my first reaction. I swear to God, because the girls in the plays, I was very young and they're very young. And so, you know, that arrogance of youth where they're real, you're real mouthy and ballsy and kind of those characters were like that. And they have these real one liners and they like just cut the nose off everyone. Whereas when I read this, it was like, oh, it's much more muted that was my initial like first reaction right but then when I started to go through it and break it down I was like oh but the muted is harder and like this is more for a mature person and it came to me at this exact moment in my life like I don't feel like I would have had maybe the depth when I was younger to play this part because I think you have to experience sadness and loss and loneliness and depression and shit to kind of know you know what I mean how that feels so once I started to rehearse it, I was like oh actually I think this could be um really good and maybe a little harder than the other parts that I play yeah. of his. Yeah. I, one thing I love about that character is she's obviously in control she's running the brother's life she's keeping everything together but we also see her vulnerability at times too how did you want to balance that well, I think I definitely have to admit that I was helped by Martin there because I did, you know, sometimes would be too sad, you know what I mean? And then, you know, and then you're like, well, you're one note, like how, how is this person going to get the gumption to leave the island or whatever? And, and she also had written for the job prior to the movie starting. So I had to have in my head, well, she did apply for a job. So there is something hope, there's some hope there. So and then it was just like the writing too, like breaking down the scenes and and the comedy kind of lied in the lines. It wasn't so much me, you know, this is where I'm going to get a laugh. Like it just was the way it was written sort of helped me with um, those sort of differences. Awesome. Yeah. And Angela, I wanted to ask you, um, you've worked on all levels of films, we know, in your long career, um, some very intimate and then some 
like Wakanda Forever that are huge spectacles in the best sense of the word that bring people out back into the cinemas. But how do you sort of stay focused on making a real human being in the midst of amazing costumes, amazing production design, huge sets around you? How do you stay, I guess, in the moment, in the character? You just always have to go back to um, the basics. And every character has a need, you know, a need that they want to fulfill, an objective. They have something, hopefully they have something that's just, that's drawing them, you know, that's pushing them, you know, um, in, in Wakanda. So I don't, I don't think about all that's going around. Hmm. I, I'm not, you know, overwhelmed by all of that. I literally am, who am I talking to? Who's in front of me? And what do I want from them? And how can I get it? And did I get it? If not, then let me try again. Let me try something else. Let me try this. And, uh, you know, in, in Wakanda, I have a need to, I have a need to make sure that my daughter's heart and head stays on straight, that, um, that she's not, um, that she's not closing herself off, that she's not in denial, that she can, uh, that she embraces this way of life. And she's really a tech science head. And she has, you know, she has uh, eschewed the, the ways of old or of the ancestors, but there's mm -hmm. something from that. There, there's some wisdom that she can glean from that. There's some hope, there's some, there's some sanity, um, mm -hmm. there's some peace. Um, so as a, you know, as a mother, I'm there for her, but yet not pushing her mm. too much, you know, pushing her just enough, but not too much. So a delicate balance. I don't want to push yeah. her away or chase her away. Um, um, so, yeah. So, I, I mean, I sit in a room with all of you, know, all the Dora Malaji, all of the, you know, the different tribes from everywhere, the, the, the wise elders are surrounding and um, it's just very simple. I want my daughter back with me. And how do I go about that? Hmm. You know, what must I get out of the way? Yeah. You know, what must I do? <clears throat> um, so yeah, it's very simple. I don't. I mean, lots been made of, um, you know, of superhero movies or comic book movies or or whatever. But in, in this one, it really is a, a story um, that depicts a lot of pain and grief and loss and all of that is just very it's very human and we all go through it pain loss death life love we all experience that mm. so that's that's what i uh concentrate on as opposed yeah, to keep it focused it's a family story uh, again at its heart yeah you definitely have to keep it grounded I, you know it's and i'm sure yeah jamie you especially know that in everything everywhere all at once which it truly truly was you know with all those props it really is about love and loss and human connecting mm -hmm. yeah jamie if i can come to you i wanted to ask you and not in a silly way at all about embracing deirdre's physicality you don't have to look thin you don't have to look glamorous this is a real woman's body um was that kind of freeing for you? So, <clears throat> I, yes, um, but I, to what Angela just said, I think each of the women in this beautiful Zoom crew, each of these characters has loss, sadness, um, rage. Um, many have been felt forgotten and uh, passed over in many ways. And so it's it's a universal theme. Mm. As Angela just said, it's human. And so it doesn't matter how absurd or how big or crazy, because ultimately it's about the human condition. And each of these women, their characters have so much of that. So, um, you know, just going to be honest. Um, I walk around clenched. I don't know about all y'all, but you know, I'm 64 years old and I just sort of clench. And, you know, we go to these things and we, 
suck it all in. And the truth of the matter is I just wanted to relax my body and let my body just be. And that is what I look like. And I would do it here for y'all now because it would make y'all laugh, but <laughs> you know, this is not anything but me relaxing my body. And the minute I, you know, pull it all in, it looks different. And I just wanted to make sure that in Deirdre's world, um, that that was just sort of honoring the fact that most people, when they relax their body, have, you know, we're all women. I mean, my God. So I've, I, I, it, it, it was just, it, even my legs, I relaxed. So everything, my little knees knocked, like, I just, did, you know, she sits all day long, all day long. So many people in the world sit all day long. And, you know, I've seen the movie WALL-E. Um, you know, we're all going to end up like that movie, guys. We're just going to end up that way. And so I wanted to honor that. And, you know, her carpal tunnel um, brace with her watch, um, again, that is a result of constant repetition motion. And anyway. That's it. I just wanted to sort of honor it and just relax everything. Um, Thank you for being real on screen oh, and, and here I tonight. Just look like this. It's all good. <laughs> Uh, Dolly, I have a question for you, which is I've um, been lucky to visit one of Ruben Oslin's sets before. And on the day I visited, he was doing something like 40 takes of one scene. And I know for some actors, it takes a while to get used to that. So I'm wondering, did you like this way of working? Was it many takes with Ruben? <laughs> um, you know, it's funny, Wendy, because um, before we started filming, before I arrived in Sweden where we shot the film, uh, I already I, I researched about how he works just so I can get an idea and I won't be shocked when I get on set. So I knew that he he would do a lot of takes. In fact, I heard that in his former film prior to this one, he did up to 95 takes for one. Yes, I know. So <laughs> I, I was terrified and I knew I had to get my cardio going and you know do the treadmill every day for 30 minutes just for stamina. But for some reason, when I got there on my first day and he kept making me do the scene over and over and over again, I don't know why it went over my head. I forgot all about it. And I was second guessing myself and thinking, did they make a mistake? Maybe I shouldn't be here. Maybe they should have cast someone else. Why does he keep making me do it over and over again? Am I never going to get it right? So that first day was really hard for me. And, and I was you know, going through a lot of self-doubt and I really felt like I made a big mistake there. But then after that, I got used to it. By the second day, I knew that, okay, this was his way. This is how it is. And I actually, I ended up really appreciating it because my background is in theater and I'm used to repetition anyway. So we do things over and over again and we rehearse, you know, we run scenes over and over again. So it kind of helped me in a way. And especially because the setting of the film is we're stranded on an island. So we're exhausted and hungry. So it really helped that we were doing it over and over again, because at some point I was really exhausted and sort of hungry. <laughs> so it, it, it helped. I, I, I do like his process. I just don't know how it would work out if it were in a different setting. Like if you're, let's say you're, you know, you're relaxed and you're just enjoying life by the pool or, you know, doing laps maybe on a pool. I don't know if I'll be able to survive that. But with this particular film, I really like that style. It, it really worked to, to my favor. And I think all of us, the entire cast, really liked his process. That's good to hear. It wasn't torture and maybe not 95 takes. Uh, Hong, I wanted to come back to something interesting you said about- I've worked with some people who have- Okay, 95, 95 takes. takes. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, my very first film um, was Inherent Vice and, and Paul Thomas Anderson does a lot of takes just because um, you know a lot of his his shots are, are really like long um, mm. you know oneers and so there's a lot of 
elements that have to fall into place for for one take to to be uh, what he wants. Um, so yeah, I guess it's just whatever you you grow accustomed to, <laughs> or adapt to different ways of working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hung, yeah I was really it, interested how you said um, that Liz isn't you know a typical best friend to him. You know, but I think there's love between them, and but also is she enabling him? And I'm wondering how much did you think about the complexities of of their relationship? Yeah, I think um, whenever we do Q and A's, I think that's always uh, something that that audiences like to point out, like what is going on with Liz? Like why would she bring him <laughs> meatball subs? Like what is wrong with her? She's a nurse; she knows, and. Uh, <sighs> You know, for me, it, it was about looking at their history and, and uh, being truthful to that because that relationship didn't, everything that they do, that didn't happen overnight. You know, it took a really long time to get there. And and then I looked at my own relationships with friends and family where I just thought, gosh, I think pretty much every single relationship that I I feel that's deep has some sort of weird codependency that's <laughs> that's unhealthy, um, maybe to to people from the outside looking at it, but is completely normal and works for for us. And that just felt really uh, true to life. And um, that wasn't um, that wasn't something that I really struggled to to reconcile. The, it, it, it seems contradictory, but it's actually the most normal um, and ordinary thing to me. Yeah, I think we could probably all recognize that in our own lives if we take a hard look. Yeah. Um, one thing BAFTA was curious uh, for you all to mention is, um, and you were so supportive of each other backstage when we just met on Zoom. It was lovely to see you, you all championing other women. Um, and I'm, uh, we're, we're curious if we can ask you, who is a woman that has made an impact on your career? Um, and I know I'm kind of putting you on the spot. It doesn't have to be a professional person. Um, it could be somebody in your life. Carrie, can I ask you that first? Jesus, that's hard, you know, because I immediately think of loads of actresses that I would have watched when I was younger. Um, you know, and that, that that that's so important for me to say, because I think there recently there was this whole like, oh, you know, people acting like we're the first women to do this and we're the first. I'm like, are you mental? There has been nothing but amazing performances from actresses all through history. And, and I wouldn't even be an actress had I not watched these amazing performances. So I can pick an actress though, because then, you know, there's, if I pick one, there's a 50 million other ones I'm not mentioning yeah. who would deserve it as much. So I don't want to go with that. Um, I suppose, you know, for the sake of staying in her good books, I'll pick my mother um, <laughs> because my mother, um, you know, she just, my parents gave me a real good work ethic. You know, we weren't allowed to loll in bed on a Saturday. We had to get up and like do stuff. and. My parents are workers, my, my parents split up and and that was tricky in Ireland at the time, a Catholic family and my mother had to take care of four children and, and all that sort of stuff. So I was kind of, she do, you know, there was just, you just don't whinge about stuff. You just kind of get on with it and you make the most of things. And, so, and also um, that there's no shame in being working class. Mm well and, and doing a job just for money there's no shame in doing a job for money like you're not blessed in this career like one percent is blessed with they're 20 they get a lead in a movie and they're they're blow up that doesn't happen like that and and so the majority of people are just working actors and it's great to be a working actor it's great to be and make a living out of being an actor so I think all those things I kind of got from my mother and um, mm. and yeah I would say her probably well done. It's an early Mother's Day present. Um, <laughs> Dolly, can I ask you, any, a, a woman who has mentored you or inspired you? You know, I like Gary's answer. Can I copy her answer? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, but it's really a combination of many different women. But I do have one. Um, and I don't think anyone else will get hurt because she she's my best friend. And she's the one who inspired me to really you know, to be an actor, uh, we weren't best friends yet. We were uh, high school batchmates. 
And I just, you know, would watch her do declamations. She would always join these contests, you know, this, the, these inter-school competitions where she would do declamations. And when I, was, when I would watch her, I would think, I want to do that. That's exactly what I want to do. I want to be like her. And after that, we became best friends and her career became so, um, so rich with so many different genres of acting. She, she would do improv, she would do stand-up, she would create so many different characters. She would always, she, her acting was always like on the edge, like on the brink of jumping off a cliff. And, you know, that's what I w- would like to, you know, achieve, it, to be able to take risks and, you know, not be afraid of failing because, you know, I'm really afraid of failing because um, probably because, when, well, now I'm oversharing, probably because when I was a kid, you know, I was punished a lot for, you know, not, you know, giving what my parents expected me to do, especially when mom was strict. So, so I like to play it safe. So with her, she inspires me to take more risks, to, you know, to just fall flat on my face and, you know, not have to worry about the circumstances and hopefully learn from it. Great. She's the Thelma to your Louise or vice versa. Exactly. I like it. That's right. Hong, do you have an inspiration or a mentor? Um, I, I do. I would say um, Maya Rudolph. She, um, I, I worked with her on, on Inherent Vice, uh, the movie that I mentioned earlier. And um, later on, a few years later, she did a, a show called Forever um, that she and Fred Armisen were doing. And they invited me to um, come in and work on an episode. But, you know, the, the people who invite you aren't the people who you have to deal with in terms of negotiating a, a salary. And it was, it was very, very low. And um, I was just really struggling with it because I didn't want to, you know, get caught into a, a really low quote. And then that would, you know, it, it would just, it was just a really difficult spot to be in. And, um, and Maya had texted me to say that, oh, you know, like come, come and play. And and I I was nervous and I I told her, I was like, the pay is so low. And I'm not joking, like 10 minutes later, I got a call from my manager to say that they had doubled what they had offered before. And that's never happened for me. And for her to just like pick up a call, pick up the phone and do that for me, um, like meant so much because we're all talking as actresses about the disparity between um, pay, uh, the pay disparity between um, men and women in, in the industry, even though we, we do the, the same work and we're out there and we're, we're promoting the movies and, and we're, we're doing the work, um, but not getting uh, compensated the same way. So, you know, that aside from that specific experience, um, I think in general, she's just somebody who's always been working and has done um, so many different things and, and just uh, brings so much joy to people. She's um, so, so that, that would be somebody um, in the industry who I would say is an inspiration. That's another good friend. Angela, do you have an inspiration or mentor? Well, uh, um, I'll have to say, you know, my mother, you know, rest her soul, um, that she was an inspiration. You know, she would also often say that when she was, you know, young, when she was 15, which was about the age I was, which was the age I was when I became interested in acting, that it was something she was interested in in school, that she was very theatrical, but um, she wasn't able to follow through. She didn't see any, any path to that being a possibility for her. But when I you know, started acting at 15 at the little theater here or in little programs or, you know, church programs or whatever. She was always very supportive, like, oh, oh, Angela, when you did this, oh, you know, she, and she would act it out. And so she was always, always very supportive, even when I continued to matriculate and go to college and, and go to Yale, you know, even, um, you know, my dear aunt who said, don't waste your education on theater because they just couldn't see a path, a way that I could support myself or live or keep the lights on or, or eat or, or do anything. Didn't have anyone down the street, no one to look toward to, to be a, a, a mentor in hand, in person. So for me, I, I looked out, I looked beyond, and I looked at people like Cicely Tyson or Rosalind Cash or Diane Carroll, you know, 
first black woman to have a you know a, a sitcom on television or you know or or like or to the theater and it would be Gloria Foster or or Mary Alice or Barbara Montgomery. So I would just look around and see these women who look like me who are doing what I have fallen in love with, sitting in the theater in tears, just enraptured. And um, and I began to believe that it was possible that there was a place for me in this situation called show, <laughs> you know, show business. So yeah, those those were oh. and continue to always be my inspiration. And yeah. then to have an opportunity to work with some of them, Ruby D and and mm. Cecilia. Tyson and and um and to uh, fill their heart and for mm. them to just embrace me and love me and make me laugh and make me cry. Mm. And we have to say you've paved more roads <clears throat> since then for this next generation. So thank you. Oh, thank uh you. Jamie, who who inspires you, who who mentored you? Who do you <clears throat> want to say? I'm sure there's a lot of people. Well, you know, it's funny, there aren't. I'm going to be, it's so, uh, you know, of course, I'm the last one to speak, and and you went to Yale. Oh, thank you. I'm just like, I'm like so impressed. I <laughs> barely got out of high school. I crawled out of high school. I went to the only college where my mother was the most famous woman to have graduated. They wanted my D plus 840 combined SAT uh, 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 academic record. That's what they wanted me because I was their girl. I'm, I am an untrained actor. I never went to an acting class. I was discovered um, uh, by accident by a man who was, used to be a tennis teacher uh, near me uh, who I ran into at, at Christmas time when I came back from my freshman year of college. And he said that they were looking for somebody to play Nancy Drew on TV and maybe I should go up for it, which I did. I ended up signing a seven year contract with Universal. I quit college because, you know, I had no business in college. And ultimately, as you know, I ended up in horror films. And <laughs> what I will tell you is that um, I did not have um, female uh, mentors. Mm. Um, Every job I got was from a man. I did not have women in my life who were um, giving me that example. But Meryl Streep made me believe I could do it. I swear, when I was doubting myself, when I would feel like my work had no value because I was in a genre that had no value, I would go see something that Meryl Streep would do and I would walk out of the theater and say, keep going, keep doing it because she is such an extraordinary talent. I've never met her. I just think she's amazing. And there's a movie that she did called Plenty. Oh, yeah. And there's a moment in that movie on the stairwell where she's losing it. And I'm telling you, they're just, it was like, I felt like all of that energy come off that screen and kept telling me to keep going. So although I've never met her, um, I've always looked at her work and said, and she went to Yale, didn't she? Right. She yeah, did. she did. But I just, you know, I really, um, I admire her craft. and. Um, so Meryl Streep. That is beautiful. And I think you have to meet Meryl Streep now. BAFTA is going <laughs> to be matchmaker or something. You know what? Wow. Okay, you know what? No, but don't they say don't meet your heroes? Like, no. I need to meet Meryl Streep. I think I, you can I, meet Meryl Streep. Right. She's going to be She'll awesome. Be all right. yeah. Yeah, I just, I think she's cool. She'll be all right. She's Yeah. Um, we're going to get to some audience questions in just a second. And so if you do have one, put it down um, in the in the chat. Um, and we'll get to some of those, but I have a question for each of you is, I'd like to hear your favorite scene from this film that you're in and why it's your favorite. Um, it could be that you, it was the scene you laughed the hardest. It could be the scene when the donkey threw up, I don't know. Um, or it could be something that really means something to you when you see it in the completed film. 
Um, so I'm just curious, yeah, what, what's your favorite scene from each of your films? Hong, could I ask you that first? Oh, the one that jumped uh, to mind, I, I think about, not, not for any of the reasons that you uh, mentioned, but I keep marveling at Brendan Fraser's technical ability <laughs> because I feel like my weakness or, or whenever um, something comes up for, for me um, that I feel like I'm not very good at is handling props. <laughs> <laughs> and if there's something where that requires a whole sequence of like, okay, you gotta pick up this and get that and and and, and do this and do that, it I, I get really overwhelmed. And so there's um a sequence when when Charlie is just gorging himself and there's a whole dance to it. And I just I the second time I watched it, I was just like, oh my God, like how did he do that? And um I was trying to pay Brendan a compliment. Um that I was really fascinated by by how well he did all of that because you you can only sustain that for for so many takes and so there really has to be a lot of calculating going on and I was trying to to say that maybe it was uh, you know because he had all of this experience prior with doing these big action movies and and I feel like there's something about people who have played sports or or have done that type of physical acting where they're really good at handling props and knowing how to handle things. And, and he just blew me off and he said, I just was trying not to do it like more than one time. So <laughs> that was all that was going on in his head. But, but that to me, uh, for me, uh, stood out as, as an actor that things that I wanna work on. Amazing. Also, you don't see any gears turning while he's putting no. the pan over here yeah. and there, yes. Um, Angela, first of all, we know you're shooting. Do you need to go back to set yet? Uh, I probably need to check the time. <laughs> okay. Um, can we just ask you this question? Do you have a favorite scene in um, Black Panther, Wakanda Forever? Um, oh gosh, I love every scene in Wakanda Forever. You know, just looking at just the work of the cast, the crew, the, the artisans, um, of course, I, I love the throne room scene where mm. she demotes um, Okoye. I love that because it's a interesting between two people, but it's a room full of, of folk and it's just a balance. You, you know, it just seems like, you know, you're fired, you know, get out of here. But just to have, it, 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 it's just a, a delicate playing and, and mixtures of, of emotions that are going on on and yet something about even though it's intimate it was something about it in that moment in the playing of that day that felt Shakespearean also and I I, I come from theater also like Dolly and it and it's my first love you know the theater stage and hitting the back wall and and you know and you just don't get that many opportunities to do that you're you know just playing the subtle and the the mic is right here and subtleties and, and all and naturalism and all of that. But it was something as big as life is and can be that was in that moment of, of a mother losing her daughter and yet, you know, maintaining mm. a, a, an amount of control as well. So mm. it was, I, I, I just loved, relished having that opportunity to do that because well, some some you know it was some things are just easy to do you know um and and um this was not not that but it was a pivotal moment yeah it doesn't look easy but it looks regal so congratulations um i we've been told that you probably do go have to go back to work so i think we have to say goodbye to angela thank you so much for joining us i love you and i'll see you for 24 hours right <laughs> yes I'll see you soon. Okay. God Thank bless. You. Thank you. God bless. Um, so Dolly, did you have a favorite scene from Triangle of Sadness? I do. I, my favorite scene is when yeah, yeah, yeah. Abigail starts giving the food to, to you know, the other passengers of, of the yacht. Uh, I, I like that scene for, for many reasons, primarily because when we shot it, I, I was we first started that scene between me and Vicky Berlin. She's the actress who plays Paula. Mm -hmm. And we went through a lot of improvisation in that, in that scene because 
Ruben wanted to see how he can do it, how he can work that power dynamic, the shifting of it, of Abigail trying to take over the power on the island and um, Paula still trying to hold on to that power. So we we experimented and tried many different ways of how we were going to do it. We we had a few takes without the stick because at some point, you know, I hold up the stick. There are some takes without the stick. Some they, we did it in so many different ways that it just gave us both an opportunity to just have fun with it and play around on set and, you know, just not take the scene too seriously and just have fun with it. That was the first half of the scene. And the second half was the other actors came came on set and their coverage was taken. So they didn't know what to expect from us. So it was also a, a nice time to, you know, to have a little play time on the the newcomers on set because they didn't know what to expect. So that's when um, in the, on the script, it's supposed to be one for you, one for me, one for you, one for me. And she's supposed to be giving out the food. But because all the other actors were a few feet away from me, I'd say five feet, it was impossible for me to step out of frame and give them the food. So we just improvised and started throwing the food at them. And because they're such great actors. And, and that's why that's also my favorite film because the ensemble of actors are just, they are just all so brilliant that they were able to catch on with what we, Vicky and I were doing. And it came out to be this beautifully orchestrated scene where we were all just doing this dance and nothing was rehearsed. So, and when, when that happens, and it's really very rewarding and very gratifying. And because Ruben does so many takes, we didn't know which one he would choose. So, yeah. We only found out when we watched the film which take he chose, and it, and that's what makes it even more fun. It's yeah. like an affirmation of oh, okay, so he liked this, ah, good choice, you know. So that's why that scene's really it, it's really my favorite scene. Yeah, it's such a fun one too. I remember when she's snacking. Yeah. Uh, Carrie, do you have a favorite scene in Banshees? I do. I love obviously. I loved all of them, but I'd say my favorite one to shoot was the one where. Dominic comes over for dinner and he's like, well, yeah, we, how come you were never married, Siobhan? <laughs> and I like that scene because we'd rehearsed, we'd done, I mean, filmed all me and Porrick stuff in the house. So me and Colin had a little routine in the morning, you know, we'd run our lines three times and we had this like little this whole setup that worked for us. So at the end of that, then um, Dominic Barry was coming in and it felt very much like this person was imposing on this little setup that we had and and I had a narrative in my head that like Dominic kind of had done stuff to Siobhan over the years you know like he'd nicked clothes off the line belonged to her or you know just weird little things that she couldn't pin him on but like he really gave her the creeps he annoyed her and blah 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 so I knew I had to drive the scene as well. Um, and I knew because Porig at that point, Colin is feeling very despondent and kind of like, you know, beaten down. So I felt like it was a bit like a boxing match and I was just going to wipe the floor with the two of them, to be honest with you. And that's kind of what I set out to do when I arrived that morning. I was like, I'm going to win this boxing match. So and then nothing is going to distract me or, you know, disturb my train of thought or whatever I mean obviously I'm not out to kill everyone I'm in a scene with but you know um there was a level of um I was about to snap in that scene and so I kind of came with that energy I think which I enjoy yes you could enjoy wiping the floor with them yes. yeah who doesn't enjoy wiping the floor with two fellas in a scene <laughs> and Jamie do you have a favorite scene from everything everywhere <clears throat> Boy, I just could listen to you people talk all day long. Um, you know, <clears throat> so I approach this work uh, similarly and differently. I don't think about it. <laughs> I, I know what I'm supposed to say and I know who I am and I just sort of let it fly. And what happened in one moment. So, of course, it's written that Evelyn and Deirdre are now lovers they now live together in their dusty pink, dusty rose um, love shack. Um, and they live in a world where they have hot dog hands. And, you know, it's absurd. And it, it, it clearly could be um, played sort of absurdly. 
And there was a level of love and loss that occurred with Michelle when the two of us, and by the way, this was shot in like an hour. You know, we, we <laughs> that sequence, that entire sequence um, was shot in like an hour, hour and a half. And it's not really written in the script. It just says that Evelyn, it's a montage of Evelyn and Deirdre's relationship coming together and then breaking apart. And as we started in the same way you were talking about an improvisation, um, Dolly, it, it, it became an improvisation about this relationship. And I, I've said it before, but it, it, it just, it's the thing that opened the door for both of us. Um, clearly they were lovers, they were living together and now they were breaking up. And um, I don't know why, but they, the, 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 the great prop department um, had like a basket of stuff that Deirdre was gonna take with her. And in it was a loofah, uh, like a bathroom loofah. And just in the improvisation, what happened was that Deirdre realized that Deirdre had bought the loofah at Bed Bath & Beyond, um, but that she didn't really use it and that Evelyn did. And so there was that moment where Deirdre said to Evelyn, I I'm gonna, I know I bought this, but you use it. And so I'm gonna leave it for you. And for whatever reason, it just cracked us both open. And all the feelings, even though we had these rubber hot dog hands, all of the feelings of the relationship between these two women um, ending came up. And all of, the, all of the experiences that we've all had ending relationships, it's hard. Uh. It's incredibly sad to walk out the door if you've lived with somebody. Yeah. And somehow it became this thing that the Daniels didn't expect. Yeah. I mean, there was a moment, it's not in the movie, where Deirdre is just like on the floor. I mean, it just continued. And, um, you know, that's what Dolly was saying. When that happens, when, when you've prepared the soil and the creative team have given you all the tools to then find that moment with a fellow scene partner is beautiful and unexpected. I remember driving home that day going like, what the, like, what this is going to be, this was going to be surreal because just the absurdity of it. And yet there it was. So that, that, has stayed with me when I see them. That is amazing. I'm going to cry every time I see a loofah. No, it's just beautiful, though, how you work. I thank you for sharing your stories. Um, we've got a couple of great questions from BAFTA members coming in. Um, a question for Carrie was uh, just about uh, how you prepared with Colin Farrell to create this sibling dynamic they mm. have. Um, that was a combination of like I'm very close to my own brother I, I've been close to him my whole life and so I you know I just knew the dynamics of of why I'm familiar with my own why I like being with my own brother and I just kind of paid attention to when I'm with them how I behave when I'm with them and the childlike kind of ways you behave and and the way when you know you can reveal like insecure things about yourself to your sibling like in a very safe place that you know you wouldn't even do to like a partner sometimes and so there was that then there was um Colin's a lovely guy like he's a really and he's not just nice to the actors like he's just a lovely person to everybody so you kind of feel safe with him and he's gentle and he's kind to everyone so that helped kind of just and then we'd rehearsal and then, um, and then I dyed my hair more to look more like him, I suppose. And then also um, when I was around him, like, you know, you'd, you'd take away, you'd, I, I would walk in a way that I knew wasn't like an attractive way. I took away all those elements of one, how you would be aware of being, like there was a waddle. I remember when I was walking to the kitchen and she's sick of him, it was more of this waddle, this like unattractive put upon, God, I, I'm so sick of this existence kind of 
Uh, lots of different things. Lots of lots of different things. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, yours, it, it's believable. I believe you could be squabbling, brother and sister. Um, Dolly, there's a question for you asking. Um, this person has heard that Ruben originally wrote the role for a man. And then somebody suggested it should be a woman. Do you, is that true? Or did you hear anything about that? Yes, that's true. Um, uh, oh. Originally his concept for Abigail was a mechanic, a male mechanic who, you know, uh, the mechanic of the yacht. Um, and then he was asking the opinion of his students because Ruben teaches film in Sweden. So he asked the students what they thought about it. And one student said, why don't you make him a woman instead and Ruben realized yes then the power play would be more you know it would be more challenging it would be something that's also more relevant with what's mm -hmm. going on with society now with the power play between it's a patriarchal world after all so yeah. if a woman is in that position of helplessness or with no power and suddenly she has power, then it would be more, you know, it would be a more uh, rich interpretation if she were a woman rather than if she were a man, because it would be easier for a man to get power, but not for a woman. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, it's true. Yeah. Um, Thank God. Yes, I, we can't imagine this role for a man now. <laughs> Thank goodness Ruben came <laughs> to his, his senses. Um, so I... Just, we had a question about fearlessness. This is from Isabel saying that seems like uh, each of you has, each of these characters has some fearlessness that comes out through rage or grief or, you know, did it, and does it feel like you have to go on a journey to get to that fearlessness for you personally to the character? I, I hope I'm summarizing that question okay. Um, Hong, do you think Liz is fearless? Um, no, I think she has a lot of fear. I, it, mainly the, the fear of, of uh, losing, losing another person that she, she loves. Um, so I, I think she's driven by a lot of fear and, and the way it comes out is, is either through anger or through, uh, humor. And, um, I, I remember, um, feeling pretty pretty comfortable and confident for the most part during during uh during filming um i have a good relationship with darren he's really um somebody that's easy for me to communicate with and uh, there was only one time one scene where i felt like uh oh i i'm in trouble and, and and that was um the scene where where charlie's choking on his uh sandwich mm. and during that take it felt um completely reasonable and uh, real for, for me to, to hit him. And uh, after, after we cut, Darren was like, no, that's, that's not, uh, we, I, I don't think that's where you want to go with this oh. hung. And, <laughs> and, um, and so we took a little break and I was just feeling like, no, I think that's right. <laughs> and um, he went back and, and talked to his think tank and, um, and, and, and I guess the the feedback from them was that that is something that that is very prevalent am, uh, amongst caretakers and, mm. and, and the people that they care for is is, is um, uh, that sort of physical violence. I just born out of frustration. And, yeah. you know, we're not saying that it's right. We're just saying that, that it's it's something that happens. And um, and I didn't think that he would use that take. So it was um, really you know surprising for me to see that that's what he ended up keeping in the movie. Um, but yeah, I, I think, I think as an actor, sometimes you just have to just, just go with, with, with your gut, with, with, uh, how you feel, um, the character would behave given the circumstances and, and feel like you're working with somebody who will at least hear you out hmm. on, on why you, why you choose to, yeah. to go in, down that road. And, and Jamie, what about you? Did you get rid of some fear to play Deirdre? Well, you know, I cut my teeth on fear. I've uh, expressed fear since I was 19 years old um, in, in a genre that requires 
a tremendous amount of vulnerability and a tremendous amount of emotion, uh, a genre that is completely overlooked in the mainstream. I mean, I have two words for everybody, Tony Collette. I mean, you know, it's just an, an extraordinary amount of work that people are doing in the genre that just seems to sort of get passed over. Um, so fear has been, I mean, it's funny, even in the movie True Lies, um, uh, uh, the, the whatever the name of the uh, spy organization that Arnold works for, the motto of it is fear is not an option. You know, so <clears throat> to get to 2020, January in Simi Valley, um, you know, the, it's the opposite of fear. Um, it's control. So Deirdre wields control. Mm -hmm. That's her entire job. She's playing people. Um, but, but, you know, I'm sure she's quite nice to some people. Um, and I'm sure she's awful to some people and it's indiscriminate. And I'm sure there's psychological reasonings behind all of it, but it's not fear. Um, the fear is the loneliness of her life. The fear is going home and sitting alone in a, in a house. That's fear, yeah. facing, facing yourself. But in her world, you know, the power she wields and yields is, is the opposite of fear. It's, 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 it's really quite aggressive. Mm. And um, uh, so um, I wouldn't say that that could be yeah. fear. We all have some fear, I guess. And yeah, Wally, course. what would you say to, to take on Abigail? She sort of revels in, I guess, shaking off that fear she has to take her power i i think it's uh well i can't speak for everyone else in this in this zoom but i think that it's not really about being fearless it's about overcoming that fear um fear will always be there and i think with abigail um she she just wanted to survive that's you know she just it was just that basic need of surviving and controlling the supplies, the food, the water. And she knew that everyone else, you know, um, didn't have any control um, in terms of their appetite and their, you know, discipline about rationing the food and the water. So she took it upon herself to control that because she was afraid for her own life. And later on in the film, her fear is um, relinquishing that power, which she enjoyed. So there is a lot of fear that drives Abigail, I believe. Um, she's just really good at covering it up and making it look like she's strong and willful and powerful, but really deep inside, she's weak and terrified. And that's why she abuses it because mm -hmm. fear takes over her. Yeah. And Carrie, what do you hope um, viewers can take from Siobhan, I guess, getting over her fear and following her own life? Yeah, I suppose in her case, it was like a fear of her own mind, you know, and like where her her mind was going to go if she stayed on the island and like men, mental illness kind of creeping into her life and that she probably thought it's just going to go south. Um, yeah, I suppose hopefully people that like change is always good, even though it's hard. Change is always a good thing. Um, and so that, you know, that she had the fearlessness to get uh, to change her life or whatever. Um, so hopefully that's an inspirational thing. But I don't know when you say about it as an actor, like fearlessness, I think like I remember one time years ago, someone telling me as an acting tip, yeah, you, you can't be afraid of making a fool of yourself. Like power to being a good actor is like you're just going to have to mortify yourself in front of a crew of people. And then we'll, you know, we then we'll rein it back a bit or you might have to go more. And you just can't be afraid of of um, looking like like an idiot. And so as an acting tip, I always liked that. I was like, well, it's not I, I'm not should not get embarrassed. Like that's not my job to be embarrassed of what I'm doing. Well, it works. <laughs> Thank you. Good advice. Um, I, I know we're out of time. I could go for hours with such phenomenal women. Wanted to say thanks again to our speakers tonight. Huge congratulations on your very well-deserved nominations. Um, I said going to be a tough vote. Um, and just to remind everybody, we've got 
BAFTA more fantastic online sessions this week. The director's conversation is tomorrow. Leading actress on Thursday, they're at 7 p.m. You can register at BAFTA.org if you look at the what's on section. And of course, we'll all be tuning in Sunday, the 19th of February, 7 p.m. on BBC One and iPlayer for the EE BAFTA Film Awards. Wishing you all the best of luck. Thanks again for sharing some of your stories with us. It was phenomenal. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Beautiful. Um, Hong, send me my information. <laughs> I will. I will. Thank you.